You're listening to the 12th episode of the In The Hub podcast, brought to you by Playbox Technology UK. In this week's episode, we speak to Matthew Baxter, co-founder and managing director of Stellwagon Ventures. Matthew has enjoyed an incredibly successful career, getting stuck in with the likes of Disney, MGM, Liverpool Football Club and many more. Hope you enjoy this episode. How are you this morning, Matthew? I'm good, mate. Thank you very well. I'm very well. You know, uh, in lockdown two, getting ready, yep. gearing up. Yep. Uh, just for any context, this podcast is being recorded on the 5th of November now. The UK has just been plummeted into a, a second lockdown for a month. Um, so me and Matthew have got a lot of time on our hands now. So <laughs> we're, we're not going anywhere. So Matthew, I think we'll get straight into the questions then, if that, if that's all right with you. Happy to, very very happy to. And, uh, good to see you this morning. Yeah, you too, Matthew, you too. Um, so Matthew, how did you get your start within the media and broadcasting industries? And was it a relatively humble beginning for you? Well, it was a long time ago. Um, so uh, look, the media, I think one thing to say is I grew up with media and content around me in my blood my family are all in it and my family from film direction to production all my father and my uncles all into it so when I was a kid I grew up on I had the privilege of being on film sets at Pinewood when I was at school and you know helping up making cups of tea but I think you know it was always somewhere direction I was always going to go into because I loved it from the from the, the beginning you know even at school just like just you know as you do doing acting on stage and things like that. that that content piece was always kind of somewhere I wanted to be and interestingly you know when when you left university you're trying to find your first job in 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 the broadcast or media industry there's a lot of people out there who want the same thing and you've got to fight hard and go for find your dreams and follow your goals and work hard at it and having family and friends in in the business I always thought it was oh just they're gonna open doors to me but quite quite frankly I, I appreciated it I appreciate it more now than I did then and, you know my father said you know if you want it you've got to go and get it and you've got to fight at it yourself I started off at the animation festival um really the three of us right at the very beginning you know in the mid 90s um creating that out of Cardiff um and it taught me a lot of things it taught me long days hard graft uh eye for detail you know working hard as a team you know without festival wouldn't have got on without us all collaborating together tough times good times fun times and then as a result of that um i got a job number six with enon kreitz who is uh one of Heim savannah's right hand man to launch fox kids and again that was everything from the beginning you know it was it was that taught me a lot um, and I'm very thankful for the team at Fox Kids at the time because, you know, a lot honestly, we were doing branding and the key point was commercial and distribution. And that's really when I began to get the flavor of commercial business and distribution of content um, because we had to do the deals with all the, all the broadcast companies and cable companies around the UK. I mean, at the time, there was over 100 cable companies in the UK, which is you know, bizarre when you think about, you know, it's Virgin now, really. So, you know, and that talks you, marketing, distribution, branding, you know, even one point when the when the presenter didn't turn up for the live show in the afternoon, I put my hat on and did some live presenting. So it was quite fun, you know. So the beginning was it was it was great to understand the full aspect and the 360 of a broadcast company and the media company was it gave you really good base and grounding and long days, hard graft, but great, great fun. Yeah, I was going to say it sounds like a really good kind of foundation to start off with when you've seen so many different aspects of, of the company. Yeah, it was, and I think what you what you, what you do, and you also then realise, I think you very realise very quickly what floats your boat and where you want to go and where oh, yeah. you want to focus your time because you got at the beginning you're so young and so hungry and so enthusiastic for everything you want to find and then you find your niche of what you want and that's when really I began to sort of focus on the sort of commercial and the sales and the marketing piece and that that area and that sort of went down that sort of followed that route as you can see sort of through my career the commercial side you know driving revenue for any business is is absolutely critical yeah definitely yeah 100 percent so Matthew, I know we were talking about Fox Kids and, and everything that you got up to there, but you've worked with some of the biggest names in the media industry up to this point. So we're talking Disney, um, obviously Liverpool Football Club, and uh, a bit more recently Dugout. Do you think you were always geared up for a move to kind of sports-oriented broadcasting? Is that something that you've always been interested in? Yeah, I, look, I, I always think follow your passions, right? And I think if you can if you can find, uh, if you're lucky enough or you're, you're focused enough to sort of find your you know, work in your passion spots in life. I think that's a really cool thing. Um, t- my two passions are content, media, entertainment and sport. You know, I've been fortunate to work with some of the biggest studios in the world, so Disney, Warner Brothers and latterly MGM, you know, and we built the MGM channel up from 
gosh, from not a lot. Um, and it was the days before OTT and long tail, all this kind of stuff. We created the channel because all these films are sitting on the shelf. And, you know, we created the channel because I spent, you know, 170 days a year on a plane for many, many years, like most people in the industry, the sports and media industry, right? So we travel a lot, unlike now, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. this, this year, in my, to be fair, in, in, in with the pandemic, you know, this year has been the least I've ever travelled ever. How are you finding it? Are you, is, is it hard to adjust to? Or? It, it's, it's, it's a strange one because, you know, when you're out there and you're meeting people and you're doing deals and you're meeting different cultures and you're understanding what the clients want and you're face to face and that buzz and the cut and thrust, I do miss that a lot. And I miss people. Yeah. You know, it's nice to be at home and nice to see a lot of my family and kids and chucking a bit of homeschooling for a good measure uh, and lockdown yeah. one, uh, <laughs> which was interesting in itself. You know, you learn learn things about yourself in these yeah, environments, definitely. right? So which is fun. But I do, I do I do miss the buzz and the cut and thrust of being out there with everybody, you know, and I mean, Zooms are great and you do nine hours of Zooms a day, but you understanding where the industry is going, what you're doing, I think is important. But back to the MGM days and travel and, you know, then selling the company, we sold that company to Liberty Global. At that point, I had a chance of a little inflection period of like, now what, sort of what next? And, you know, at that point, it was like, well, my other passion is sports. I want to go and work in sports. So I went and hunted a sport job. And someone at the time told me, you'll never work in sport because you work in media and entertainment. They're so different. And, you know, the world's colliding and convergence. Now they're all the same thing, right? You know, you've got fashion, sport, music, industry, gaming. They're all together in one pop. But at the time, if you think about it, they weren't. You know, I thought, you know what, my passion is sport and I want to go and work in sport. I want to experience it. And, you know, that was a time when, you know, I turned 40 and I thought, hang on, I'm going to go for this and have a look. So I was very fortunate and had a great, great time working with the guys at Liverpool and building the media, media industry, but also understanding how a football club runs was amazing. And, you know, that was that was sort of the So was I geared up to have a, uh, a career in sport? I think following your passions. So whatever your passions are in, and for me, Yes, sport is a passion. I love it. So whether it was football, whether it was rugby, whether because I, I was I played rugby at school and at university, and rugby or cricket or hockey or netball or whatever it may be, I wanted to work in sport in some capacity. Yeah, yeah. So branching off from from your time at Liverpool FC, obviously, how did it prepare you for your future in, in the sports industry? No, it's a good question. I think you look. I, I think you know my job when was very clear from the remit from the the CEO and the chairman and the owners to say go and build us a positive uh, a revenue driving media business so when I started Liberal there wasn't that many people working on social media it wasn't massive at the time and you know and, and growing that I think again when you look back at all the all the career points from Fox Kids to Liverpool you've got a grounding in the whole broadcast industry so whether you're making a studio for live sport for live academy football or you're making an ott platform which we did lst tv go or you do a new web service or you do an SOD service i think what it frames you for is understanding the full remit of the broadcast space and the, the media space um, and how sport works but also when you're on a, with the directors of the club and you're on the sort of the exec board you you're, you're learning at the business of sport you know how does the business sport how do you fit within the eco- ecosystem and how does sport progress and what how do you move a club forward, a league forward, a federation, and all those? You, you suddenly get exposure and understanding every layer of a sport, which is really, really interesting. So, you've got your sort of day job in the media bit, but then you've got the holistic view, the macro view of of sport in, in a whole. And I think that really prepares you for anything you do because you can equate those elements to sort of any industry. But yeah, with it's got a sports slant on it, and I think it really sets you in good stead. And I think one thing you, one thing I would say about sport. Uh, especially from media side and how does it set you up I think you know sport is about the fans it's about the people who come and passionately embrace the sport you know they're in the stadium they're sitting in their house in New Zealand to Alaska and everyone's in it and everyone feels the same thing it doesn't matter what where you come from who you are that feeling of support and passion and belonging and wanting to be with your club is wholly important to have that relationship in any sport don't care what the sport is, is is absolutely critical. No, 100%. So this next question, I think we touched on dugout a little bit, but if you want to talk about how that kind of adapted through the pandemic, if if, if we can touch on that. I think it's important. I think, yeah, I'm happy to. I think, you know, I think it's important to understand sort of where dugout came from. And, you know, dugout was all about giving clubs the ability for reach engagement, revenue and data. And, you know, a lot of clubs have content, how do you get it out there and into the marketplace in a brand safe environment without 
without algorithms killing it and get it and, and creating a network where you know you can monetize your content but talk close to the fan and understand the fan through data understand give the fan proper engagement of your content and, and you know where where dugout came from it was very clever from the chairman elliot richardson was to, to sort of work out that actually fans across the world support 4.6 clubs and at the time that was a, a revelation really because especially in asia you know and, and other areas of the world people support multiple clubs and they also support multiple players as they go through you know yeah, yeah. gareth bale southampton tottenham madrid back to top they follow players as well as as well as clubs yes you might have a passion point for a certain club but you are a fan of that that sport and you follow follow a multiple amount of clubs so bringing the clubs together and creating them i mean you know, 10 of the clubs are our shareholders in the business. I signed the contract for Liverpool to be a shareholder in Dugout and they want to help across to grow it and run it and help grow it to where it is today. And I think today it's at 120 clubs. It's hundreds of 500 million views per month on a network worldwide, you know, across. And it's about having contextually relevant content at the right time and access to your fans. So, you know, had it adapted during the pandemic, I mean, it's interesting, you know, as you probably can see from your own behavior in the in the sphere of content people are hungry for content all the time and if it's contextually relevant about what's going on yes you can look at all the stuff from yesteryear and all that kind of stuff and there's all those anniversaries and there's always goals and there's always but, but people want to know what's going on in training and how people are coming back and you know, people are digesting content all the time and more so than ever now content's become really important especially when there was you know at the beginning there was no no sport at all now football's back yes in a different way because there's no fans in the stadium fans are even more important than ever they really want to know and feel as close to their club as they possibly can so ad adapting is is an interesting question but i think it's just about understanding the environment you work in and giving the fans what they want yeah. if, if your consumer is first and the fans first you listen to what they want to see what they're using and see what they they want to hear about then you are in the right spot so just wanted to ask matthew are you uh, an advocate of the support in 4.6 clubs each or well being born and bred in south london i'm a crystal palace fan and uh, my granddad was a uh, had a house uh, in the homesdale road end actually right there at crystal palace so uh, my family are born and bred Palace fans. My son uh, and my my girls and my every every part of my family is Crystal Palace. But you know, growing up in the seventies and eighties, you know, Vince Allaire time and you know all that Terry Venables era of Palace. You know, I was a season ticket holder in the late seventies, early eighties, when my father took me and my brother. But at the time, the only people you could see really on TV were the, sort of the big teams. So my second team is Crystal uh, is Liverpool. So I was very, I, as well as having, you know, worked there, it was, a, it was an honor to, honor to work there and a privilege, um, but they were my second team. So I've always had a, a, a passion for Liverpool. And then, you know, interestingly through sort of going through dugout and working at Liverpool and watching my, my son is um, now 10 and his behavior is he loves Real Madrid. He loves Barcelona in the same guys, you know, and he'd probably be unheard of a few years ago. Then he loves, he loves Paris Saint-Germain and he loves Bayern Munich and he loves Liverpool. And he loves Crystal Palace because he has to, but um, <laughs> you know, it's, so yes, I, I think the 4.6 things is, is more prevalent now than ever because everybody wants to watch good content good football good players and have, have access to what they do yeah and why not why not i tell you a quick story whether this makes the podcast or not but you know please do yeah <laughs> when you're wearing, when you're in a taxi in vietnam you know what what do you talk about where are you from what's the weather like and who do you support right and a taxi driver said to me a taxi driver said to me i like mk dons I'm like what and this is in the middle of Vietnam. He goes, yeah, I like MK Dons. I said, why is that? Because the first person he met to talk about football when he was a taxi driver supported MK, MK Dons. So he now supports MK Dons. Yep. So that just shows you the globalization of any team and any football at any level. Yep. yep. Like you said, it's a universal language, isn't it? So, sure. uh, you know, wherever you go, that, that's something you can talk about. So branching off a little bit more from kind of dugout and what they were doing to, to overcome and adapt during the pandemic. Do you think that the pandemic had a, a major impact on the nature of sports rights and, and do you think valuations have been affected by the temporary hiatus i think the pandemic has an effect on everybody in every industry and every person in the world but it's one of those extraordinary we're in extraordinary times right and which has been said a lot this year and i think yeah. in sport in particular and you know i'm 
you know, we'll come on to Cell Wagon Ventures and music. And I think it's the same thing. You know, there's no fans watching music in touring. There's no fans in the stadium. You know, people are watching it on TV more. And you can see with in the UK, you know, you're looking at the OTT platforms charging pay-per-view per matches. And there's been some interest around that. The, the, I think taking a step back, what I feel is that now is the time, and it has been in a, in a good way, of true partnerships, really. Yes, there's some outliers, whatever, but I think generally speaking, whether you're a, a brand, a league, a federation, a broadcaster, a rights holder, everybody's had to come together to try and find and find a win-win solution. So if you're a brand working with a club and you've got activation in, in the stadium, how do you do virtual activations or how do you do, you know, when you're talking about dugout or you're talking about digital content, how do you create more digital content that's rich for the consumer? So your rights package might have been X, but now it might be Y and slightly different. And I think I feel that the way that, you know, it might, it's going to open up the market for more sponsors to come in at different levels because there'll be different packages and there's a different way to think about it. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the rights world, they're, they're, you know, ultimately it's about, the value and of, of the money they're giving to the leagues and then the leagues and the money, how it flows down to grassroots and beyond. There, there is a structure there that has to exist. Otherwise the, the game you're paying in has, has an impact. Whatever that impact is, it depends. So I think everybody in their, their right mind has actually pretty much stayed true to what they're trying to do to, for, for the good of the holistic game. And I think it's about the, the word really is about how does everyone and, and they are, working true partnership to get through this period to come out the other side in even a clearer and a better way in a more efficient way maybe you know what's your general opinion concerning ott and sports and, and do you think non-linear content can ever you know come close to the thrill of a live champions league final a live sport is is incredible it's it's everything you know it's it's uh tears blood sweat in it's sharing it with the person next to you it's the stadium it's the thrill it's the smell of the grass whatever you want to call it you know you can go you can go to rugby matches and you can hear the crunch of a tackle or you you know you, you you're on you know a basketball game and or the lights going off at an ice hockey game you know, it's it just it just, it's, it's the whole thing when you leave home and some people have things they have to do on the way to the stadium and I love that kind of stuff I think it's brilliant and then, you know the whole feeling of that coming together for an event is is is, is unique but that said you know some people can't go to those games. Some can't go. Can't people can't go to? They can't be season ticket holders, or they can't get access to them. The world's big, right? So, if you're a Liverpool fan and you're in Jakarta, how do you get to the stadium every week? You can't. So, and like we've got MK Don fans in Vietnam as well. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah, that just illustrates it. So, yeah. how do you bring the key for OTT and the key for digital content? Is how do you bring the fans close to the stadium or close to the, as close to that feeling as possible? Champions League final, brilliant, right? Fantastic. I've been very honoured and privileged and lucky to be able to go to Champions League finals and they're a spectacle. They're great. But, you know, that is, depending on the stadium, 30, 40, 50,000 people in the world could get to go and do that. So there has to be a space for OTT rights holders, you know, and, and broadcasters to show that. But I think then you layer it down and understand the data and the fans and where they are and how they want to interact with that to really bring them closer to the action as they possibly can be in that feeling of having the passion of lots of people with them is the key. So whether, you know, some people want to go down the pub and watch it or some people want to sit at home with their friends, but understanding what they want is really important. And I think there's always going to be, I mean, OTT platforms give a, give a lot of sport a lot of visibility that they may not have had. And it gives, and, it, and if you know the last few years, a lot of sports have got a lot more eyeballs than they would have had previously in that in that regard. So, yeah, I, I think there's, a, there's there's room for all of them to fit together, but it has to be how how and where you do it with the fan. How do you feel about simulated crowd noise? I don't know if you've been watching any of side the boxing recently, or it's interesting. That's a great great question. Do you know what? It's quite funny because I've watched both, right? And it depends on who I'm what it depends on who I'm watching, if I'm honest. So I watched at the beginning, I watched the Liverpool game without the crowd noise because I just wanted to hear the pitch, you know, because it's very rare that you actually get to sort of, you know, get them to say man on rather than the whole forty thousand people <laughs> saying man on, you know, is and like, yeah. oh, move, do it, you can hear, hear the manager. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, definitely. So it depends, it's to be honest, it depends on who I'm watching. So if I'm watching sport in general and it's like a team and I'm just enjoying it, I like the crowd noise because I think it makes me feel like if I'm in the lounge, I'm just chilling out with family and it's on or whatever, I quite like the crowd noise. If I'm actually watching a game, 
I actually quite like the differentiation because I feel like I'm standing on the edge of a pitch, like watching my son's under 10. You can hear the manager shout, you can hear what everything's going on. It's a bit like that. You can really hear what's going on. So I, I understand some people don't like it, but I like the mix, depending on what I'm watching. And they've done it very well. Sorry, on the simulated crowd noise. When you get, like, it hits the crossbar or whatever like that, you go, ooh. So they've, done, they've actually done the simulated crowd noise very well because it matches the action on the pitch. They could have quite happily just bled it on and just been it generic, but they've done it very well. So kudos to the people who've done that. Yeah, in my head, I'm imagining it to be some engineer sat in a back room uh, with just a, a kind of soundboard. Do you do you like it? It's a difficult one because I, I've watched quite a bit of the boxing since it came back and it's it's been wild to hear the actual lever of the gloves hit yeah. and stuff like that. It's It's... It's abs- and you can hear the corners shout into the fighters and stuff like that as well. So, which is interesting, right? Yeah, exactly, hundred percent. So, I think at, at this point, I'm I'm keen on anything that returns us to the normality. So, if I was to watch football, I'd, I'd want the crowd noise. But like you said, it has been really insightful to just hear, you know, the natural sounds of the sport for once. So, when the fans get back in the stadium, maybe there's another option: no crowd noise. You switch them off. Maybe that's one of the new things we're going to find, right? Mute them, mute them. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think just to close out on the questions, Matthew, you know, what do you see as the future for the, the sports broadcasting landscape in general? Well, look, I think, you know, sports broadcasting is not going anywhere. Again, it's about access for fans to get close to their sport. There's a proliferation of platforms, you know, over the last few years, you know, what's the zone's done with, you mentioned boxing, you know, especially in the US and stuff like that how do fans get to see at the right price and the right money what their sport is and different there's there's talk about different leagues there's different structures i think ultimately the industry's got to be careful not to have you know there are only there's a certain amount of budgets for fans you know worldwide and what you want to you don't what you don't want to do is sort of um too much proliferation because it's saturated you, you just don't want you to be careful of saturation point with your fans but then you know that's the holistic view of all sports but if you're focusing on your sport how do i get that how do i get my sport in front of the fans in the best way and also making sure that you are reaching great because everyone wants to grow their sport how do you make sure that when you're doing that in broadcasting you are going with the right place to grow the sport in the right way is is, is very important so there's, there's, some, there's some key decisions to be made and sometimes make sure that you are looking at the the, the mid to long term view, not just the 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 the, the money or, or the opportunity in front of you. Make sure you look at race the wider picture. So, for anyone who might not know about what you guys get up to at Stellwagen Ventures, could you just kind of provide a brief introduction to the uh, to the company? Yeah, sure. So, interestingly, um, you know, I, uh, we started a company with my, my partner who lives in Boston, Jeff Walker. We created a, a company back earlier this year called Stellwagen Ventures. Really, it was it came out of the pandemic when we were talking about fans and touring with music and fans in the stadium. And, you know, there's an, an opportunity for helping companies, sport companies, sport businesses, music businesses help monetize their assets of artists or whatever they've got. During you know because no one's that's the, if you take music touring is is a, is a, re, a huge revenue stream for artists where they make a lot of money and suddenly that that revenue's been cut off so if you Stellway Convention really blends itself down into sort of five verticals we work in music sport media entertainment and investment so if you take those verticals in music we're really looking at the the IP rights and the sales of IP rights um, to give artists and bands a huge payday. Uh, that they may not have seen before and also because they're not getting paid now so it's a very very big hot topic in the industry at the moment with you know people doing a lot of big deals I mean you know Calvin Harris if anyone knows Calvin Harris sold his um, streaming rights a couple few weeks ago just nearly 100 million dollars so it's big business it's making a lot of money and you know we we me and my partner Jeff were working on a deal uh, when we were talking earlier this year and you know the, the market's moving fast and you know we're working on music deals of seven eight and nine figures and you know it, it's, it's a big big business and, and a fast business and a growing business so we, we're, we're perfectly placed uh in that area and then you know in the investment side we work on a number of investments so we have a number of uh parties who are looking for seed through to abc uh, uh and growth funds for the business, everything from sports data play to entertainment businesses to 
a lot of areas uh, of um, technical growth. So we're working with a lot of investors in that area. And the sports and media uh, space, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff in the, the partnership side. We talked about previously in the podcast in terms of brands for clubs, activation, um, and helping agencies who've got talent grow their business into new sports. So it's a it's a very, very nice portfolio and a very good blend. And, you know, we're very lucky to have built up a good number of good uh, key portfolio of investors behind us who can help us uh, grow the business, but also help those we work with um, drive their business in a, in a very meaningful manner. You know, and we, over the course of, I mean, we officially launched on August the 17th, but we're working on it over this year. We've probably built up a pipeline across the board of nearly 40 pieces of business, which is meaningful revenue across the board. You know, and, and a lot of those are converting. So very exciting time across all, all opportunities. So and it's been fun. It's been really interesting to launch that business with Jeff uh, in the pandemic. You know, and you, you realize that everybody, there's a, still a hunger and a passion to get stuff done and want to find new ways and new methods. And I think that's what we provide. You know, we've built up a, a, a very good we call it sales force, but really there are people from our contact network who are out finding deals with us as well. And we share in that success. Our model is a share, share success model. So anyone who finds deals or wants to go and work with us will share in the upside and share in the, share in the deal at the end. So we've built up on a number of people we work with for a win-win model. I think and then that, that really has helped drive the business in and drive the results we've seen. Um, with the team around us so it's been very good and we've got an internship program so we've got a few people out of uh, Boston College who help us on, on the internship program and we have a, a very very strong PR company in Elude as well so we've got a really good network already and, uh, and yeah it's, it's future's looking good. Yeah, and so we've done all that in, during a uh, an unprecedented pandemic as well. It's really something, isn't it? It is. It's been exciting, and you know, you know, let's be honest. No one's going anywhere. We're sitting at home and doing stuff. And timing's everything. Musicians and artists are really desperate to find out the value of their assets, and then working on the brand side uh, in sport. How do we adapt the brands because there's no fans? And what are the what are the sports clubs doing to to attract new fans and how they work? So, you know, a lot of the data businesses work with, you know, they're absolutely flying because they're really helping those businesses do the, the clubs or sport business and what they're doing, you know. And so it has been, it's been really interesting, long days, but fun days, you know, and, you know, and, you know, working, set, finding ways to set up a new office at home, you know, it's been, you know, things like that is interesting, right? But, you know, like, like music and sport, the, there's no switch off. And I think we're very, very well covered with, Jeff uh, being in Boston and me in the UK, we can make sure we're available 24-7, which has made us move at a very, very quick pace, which has been very helpful. Um, so are there any kind of exciting projects that you can tell us uh, that are in the pipeline for Stellwagen, or, or is everything quite uh, under covers at the moment? Uh, I, think, I, I think I can talk generically, because obviously NDAs are important in life. Um, no, of course. <laughs> but I think, you know, we are really in a very good space for let's take each element really in the music space you know we've got a couple of dozen deals in the music space and they vary from master rights to publishing rights and across the board you know and we were working with all genres from djs to popular music to folk music country music indie music latin music you know you name it we're working with a hot it doesn't matter who 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 or where you are in a band or an artist or you know but we are you know, we're at perfectly placed with the portfolio investors we've got because we can find your product and put it with the right investor to give you the right amount of money at the right multiple, right? So people are playing some very good multiples in this market. And, you know, even if you, d you don't w want to sell your human rights, it, it, or, it's worth finding out the value oh, of what your asset's about, yeah. a bit like selling your house, right? And then you can make a decision. So I think the, the good thing here is we've got some really good financial modeling people we work with who can help understand what that actually means for you going forward so in the music space you know finding as many artists and bands and music as possible and helping them find the value of their products uh, and there are a lot of people out there who want to invest in those assets so that's i mean we've got a lot we've got you know two dozen pieces of business and growing at the moment and in the sports space you know there's a number of um opportunities we're working on in multiple sports cricket Esports, you know, football, rugby, uh, Formula One, and you know, and I think one of the things that's interesting, looking at pathways projects of how talent and athletes look in their journey. You know, not everyone makes it, or injuries. We're, we're looking at some opportunities within that space for actually talent and athletes, which I think, you know, that's kind of 
an important part. I quite am quite enjoying investigating that part and how that works and trying to work out with various clubs and various sports how we can put a pathways program in place is interesting. So look, we we're all about growth and business and growth of sport. So you know, and then the and then the key part is how we create those partnerships within that area is very important. So probably we've got over 40 pieces in the, in the pipeline and, and, and growing and the team is growing. Um, we have a, a number of people we're uh, strategically working with and growing that business. So, you know, that's what, that's what, you know, I, I can't really tell you more detail, but you know, if you want to know more, you can, uh, being honest, if you want to know more, get in touch, you can probably find my details through this podcast or head to, you know, stellwagonv.com, which is our website. And look, if you want to drop me an email or link in with me, I'm happily have a discussion or a conversation with anyone because, you know, we're all in strange times. And if we can all help each other to win-win in whatever you're doing, that's the ethos of Stellwagon Ventures, right? It's a win-win model for everyone. And that's what that's that's what the company was set up on and that's that's what we want to try and achieve that no, sounds really great so i mean you've already touched on how people can get in touch with you so it's it's the website which is stellwagonv.com that's right or uh, find you on linkedin yeah exactly um you find me on linkedin exactly and then um very happy to take uh calls or in, in, in chat to anybody and i'd love to hear any opportunities and you know the structure behind us we can touch on anything in music sport media and entertainment so and investment so yeah i'm very happy to chat to anyone or if and you know in pandemic if people being honest if people want some advice and they're trying to find their way as well you know i'm very happy to offer a, an ear or a lending hand or a discussion and if i can help anyone in any way um I'm also happy to have those conversations because times are strange. And I think that's what, if everyone can lean in together and try and help each other, that's that's important. So if I can be of any help in that area, please shout. I can only, you know, thank you for taking the time out this fine lockdown morning to speak to us on the podcast. Um, really appreciate it. Well, no, and thank you for your time and thank you for uh, the opportunity. And I really appreciate it. And look, you know, um, it is interesting times. It is strange times. But I think as long as we are all looking after each other and staying safe and doing the things we should do and, you know, and enjoy the things we like, whether that is sport, whether it's music, whether it's entertainment, whether it's whatever it may be, you know, I think we've got to enjoy those things. And, um, you know, it's pretty stressful at times out there. And I think, you know, enjoy the fresh air where you can get out and clear your head and then enjoy those enjoy the enjoy some nice things switch on some nice music watch some good sport and you know and we'll, we'll come out the other side yeah definitely i've been very impressed by the resolve of people exactly you know um we find out all stuff about ourselves and i think that's part of our own personal journey and i think I think what I've seen where I live is the growing sense of community and helping people out, which I really yeah. like. And I think, you know, if we can all do that in work and business, I think we're only going to be in the right direction. No, 100%. I think that's a great note to end on, Matthew. So, again, thanks so much for coming on and speaking to us today. It's been really appreciated. No, thank you very much. Appreciate it too. Cheers.